Oh, that's beautiful. Ooh, very nice. Four speed. Kiwi! Hey, man. I came to steal content from you again. <laughs> there you go. I thought I'd give you a call on this one because it was right up your alley. That is so beautiful. Isn't it pretty? What's the story on this thing? Uh, it's just coming today. Uh, it's got a water leak somewhere around the water pump timing cover, which we haven't really had a look at yet. Um, but it's just chucking some water out. Um, but yeah, the guy, this belongs to a, a, a guy a little bit older, um, but he had this, bought this car as a teenager. Older than us? Older than us, yeah. That's scary. That's scary. Um, he bought it as a teenager, like in 1975. Okay. Uh, and he's had it ever since. He had it fully restored in 2005. And I gotta say, it's a really nice restoration. I mean, just what I could see looking over real quick. Yeah, they, uh, oof. Yeah. Nice pretty. car. It's pretty, so, you know, given that it's a 20-year-old restoration now, 19 years old, uh, it's really standing the test of time. Okay, it's been garaged and looked after, but still, you know, there's, there's no issues with the car at all, other than this little water leak, but you can see it's chucking a little bit of water out. Oh, but yeah, cool, everything's yeah. correct and done nicely. And, it's got all the Mopar stuff, yeah, Mopar radiator, Mopar radiator hoses. Oh yeah, it's got the bull nose. Yeah, clamps on the old clamps, they'll be fun. Uh, just, you know, all the right stickers and, I mean, I know a lot of it you can get out of, of a, a um, catalogue, but this is, um, it would have been a nice car to restore because having one owner since 75, it's not been, it's not been put through the ringer like a lot of these. I mean, it is practically one owner. Yeah, yeah. Um, apparently it was a little a little um, run down when he got it. Uh, he paid thirteen hundred bucks for it back in seventy five, <laughs> which he had to get a loan off his parents to get that. You know, uh, there is so many little special parts on these cars. So yeah, of course, you can't just look at a car like this without going from front to back and talking about all of the unique features you're going to find on a TA Challenger or an AAR Cuda, which was the Plymouth version of this. How much history do you know of these cars? Not a great deal, to be honest. It's really we really didn't see any of them in New Zealand, so I just I never, you know, New Zealand was kind of Fords and Chevys, but the, the low cars never really took hold. Well, because you know, a lot of that was we had you know the Australian Mopars. So, so the basic history of these things is that there used to be a, a, a series called Trans Am. The SCCA, the Sports Car Club of America, had a Trans Am series, and it was intended for pony cars. So. The TA Challenger and the AAR Cuda were basically the image cars for that series. But a lot of the things that are on this car that, that made them special from the showroom never actually made it to the uh, to actual racing. In fact, there's a couple of things unique to these engines that the package is really built around that were never put to use on the engine itself. Right? I know that sounds sounds a little crazy, right? It does sound a little crazy. It but does. I'm sure you're going to enlighten us. I guess I am. I'm, so, a, I'm as interested as hopefully the viewers are. You know? All right. So you start off with the engine on these. It's a 346 pack. We'll talk about the six pack in, in a minute. But the the difference, the unique features of the TA engine as opposed to a regular 340, are the blocks are unique. The cylinder heads are unique, and then of course there's the intake manifold. But while they're unique, they're not any different than the regular production 340 stuff. Sounds crazy, right? Let me show you how that happened. So Chrysler needed beefier parts for a couple of reasons. First, to keep the Trans Am series, and those engines were limited to 305 cubic inches. That's another thing important to know about this. But they needed beefier and slightly altered from regular production parts to meet the demands of that series and nascar see there's a nascar connection to this that nobody ever talks about early in 1970 nascar says you know what no more hemis in the wing cars if you guys want to run wing cars you know daytona's and the superbirds you got to run a 305 so automatically you're talking about the 305 spec trans am engine which was a standard bore 340 block a lot of traffic out of here. 
Sorry, this is all we can do right now. The standard 340 block, four inch plus 40 over with a D-stroked crank and very unique pistons because the 305 NASCAR engine and the 305 Trans Am engine both used the stock length connecting rods, 6.123 long connecting rods. So they used a unique piston that dropped the pin way down to get the piston up there to make compression. So that's that was the 305 combination. So 340 block, de-stroked, stock 340 rods, and then these crazy pistons. So And, th and those were all done through Keith Black Racing. He was a subcontractor for Chrysler. So the block is a two bolt main block like a standard 340 but they increased the amount of beef around the pan rail and the section between the pan rail and the cap so you've got that little section there and that's so that you could four bolt main these and when you run these engines over 6500 7000 rpm for any amount of time the caps want to walk so the four bolt cap becomes kind of a necessity so even though the pan rail and that that bottom web section of the block can accommodate a four bolt main, they came as two bolts. Now the other thing is the cylinder heads. So these are J heads, but they're unique J heads. So the W2 program was still, they were still working on the W2. These are the predecessors to the W2 heads. Now, as these things are finished, they are exactly the same as any other J head. One exception, they have a 202 intake valve like the previous X heads. But these are J's, and they have the 202 intake. The rest of the J's have 1.88, so that's the 360 head that everybody knows. The difference with these heads, aside from the larger intake valve, is that they added a little more beef between the push rod and the intake port, the push rod hole and the intake port. Because when you port these things, when you port a standard small block Mopar head to its maximum capacity, let's say, to, there's, a, there's a push rod pinch in there. So they casted these things with the push rod holes moved over just a little bit. So when you port them out, you have a clean shot at it. But neither of those revisions, either to the block or to the cylinder head, were actually employed on these engines. The casting material is there. And like I said, is that keep the, because remember when NASCAR said no more, no more Hemis in the wing parts, they're gonna be limited to 305 cubic inches. Chrysler still had a lot of racers out there they were still supporting the wing car program, so they had to give these guys at least something to work with. And there's, there's a very interesting story uh, about Mario Rossi's the 305 Daytona and the 1971 Daytona 500. That's something Brian Loans needs to do a video on. All right, I don't want to go there. But yeah, Brian, if you're watching this, right? The Rossi Daytona. Great story. All right, so that's... That's what was unique about the engines. Everything else on these is standard 340. The camshafts, the pistons, the exhaust manifolds, everything is just standard 340. And you get to the intake. You wanna get your pump? So the Trans Am series only allowed a single four barrel for 1970. Previous years they had different carburetor, config carburetor configurations. But for 70, they were limited to a single four barrel. Chrysler put the six pack on these probably just to give them enough street cred, make them different enough. Because you're selling a premium package. And the premium package is on the same lot as 446 pack and Hemi cars. So how do you give this thing that little bit of an extra edge? Throw a six pack on it. So the carburetors on this are the same exact ones that are found on a 446 pack. It's a 350 CFM center and it's a 500 CFM, a pair of 500 CFM outboards. Now these carburetors are exactly the same as the 446 pack from 69 and they actually have their roots in a 1967 Chevy, the 427 435. And the only difference between the Chevy carburetors and these are that these have a provision for ported vacuum for the vacuum advance that's what this line is over here and on these you've got a 5 16 inlet line on the passenger side and the chevy has a 3 8 inlet side on the driver's side but other than that these are exactly the same carburetor as used on the 427 435 and the 446 pack so 1350 cfm total right advertised total the actual flow on these combined for the three is approximately 975 cfm so now Next time somebody tells you that an 850 Holly 
is too big for a stock 340. You know, tell them about this because this is 975 CFM actual flow and nobody ever complained about the 346 pack being over carbureted. It's just the right amount of carburetor for these things. All right, so that's that's pretty much the engine, right? Everything else is uh, regular 340 stuff, regular 340 Challenger stuff. They do have a fender tag over here. Trans Am fender tag. Um, now the hoods. Apparently that's the thing is that you've got a painted screw in the middle and, and stainless screws out here. Apparently that's how they came from the factory. Little little tiny yeah. details like that the owner was t telling me. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, what, exactly why I don't know. But, huh? So the hood, the hood is another thing. So this is a fiberglass hood. Can you lower it down? And it has this beautiful boundary layer scoop. So this is the second version of a boundary layer scoop. The first was on the 69A12 cars, or 446 packs. This is the second version of it. It's just clean. That's just a beautiful, timeless scoop. And uh, it's light. These are a big hood. Yeah, they it's made, a big made hood. A huge weight saver because that's like really light. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons why you have these springs here. Oh, okay. They needed these smaller springs because the hood will just fold in half <laughs> if you had the regular the regular springs on there. So there's another unique thing about these hoods. Okay, in 1970, Chrysler started production of the 426 Hemi Challengers right. with a shaker. Yeah. Okay. But it failed crash tests because the shaker, the shaker hood they were using on the 426 Hemi cars, didn't have uh, any provisions here for a crumple zone. They had no cutouts or dimples for a crumple zone. So on a head-on collision, the hood launched itself through the windshield Ooh. instead of bending up. So in order to fill the gap until they could restamp the shaker hoods, right. these TA hoods were used on the Hemi Challenger. So a lot of people look at a Hemi Challenge and say, oh, it's supposed to have a shaker. No, uh, most of the 1970s came with these hoods. Huh. There you go. Um, what else we got here? It's got these chin spoilers. Very snazzy chin spoilers. Just well, beautiful. Two individual ones. Yeah. 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 Factory hood pins, obviously, because, you know, and no spring or anything like that. Oh, no latch. No. no yeah, no latch, no spring. Um, all the unique features on these cars. I could go around these things all day, right? But you notice there's no there's no antenna here on the passenger side front fender. On the TAs and the AARs, they moved them back here. Why did they do that? Why did they do that, Kiwi? I have no idea. Aerodynamics. I have no idea either, but it's something that they did, and it's a unique feature of these cars. So two other really unique features that jump right out at you. Um, oh, of course. The spoiler, part of the package. So, the side exhaust. So this car has a couple of distinctions. This is the only American car that I know of that came from the factory with a side exhaust system. Not, I know, side bedside, side pipes and all that. I'm talking about an undercar exhaust system that exited to the side. So, this is the factory setup on these things. And they have a very unique muffler. So we can get the muffler. I don't know how the light's going to be. Ah. You can see the muffler, and it's it's hung on an angle so that the, the exhaust pipe can be straight. The muffler has both the inlet and the outlet at the front, and nothing at the back. So the exhaust just basically makes a U-turn. Why did they do that? Probably the same street cred that they got with the six-pack. How do you ignore something like this? Couldn't get it on a Hemi car, couldn't get it on a, on a 446 pack, but you could get it on this. So it's a little jewelry like that that made the difference. And this car has one other unique feature that you never find in any other production car. The tires. So these are reproductions of the original poly glasses. And you see the, the back has a G6015 and the front an E6015. So these things came from the factory with a stagger. Yeah, 
you know, there's probably a hundred of the little details that are escaping me right now because right. I'm really not an e-body guy. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm giving you everything off the top of my head that like a, an e-body, a non-e-body guy would know about these cars. So what's in here for again? Uh, just a water leak. Yeah. It's got a coolant leak. Uh, it appears to be leaking between the, the uh, tire okay. chain cover. Let's go this way so they can see the coal when you're talking about There you go. Uh, yeah, it seems to have a water leak between the timing cover and the uh, block. So yeah. let's just pull the front off the motor, um, put some new gaskets in, make sure there wasn't, you know, try and see if we can see a cause for it. But sometimes they just fail. Uh, and yeah, send it on this way. It's, it's not a big job, but it's um, when he, you know, depending on the car, I might have said, no, we don't have time. Right. But when he said what it was, it's like, mm, yeah, I'll make time for that one. I, I would probably make time for Yeah. It. And how often do you see a like a, a fully restored TA challenge? I feel so bad stealing his content from him that I'm not even going to have him start it up and take it for a ride. You're going to have to go to his channel. Yeah. Kiwi, what the hell is the name of your channel again? Kiwi Classics and Customs. <sighs> okay, yeah. Go there, right? And he'll have the, the work that he's doing to it and it'll take you guys for a blast. These things are just so much fun. Any four-speed e-body is a blast. Yeah, I mean, I, I, honestly, it'll be the first time we've ever even driven a, a um, pistol grip. Oh, dude, you're going to be hooked. Yeah. You're going to be hooked. So, like, I just had to get it in the door and make time. Uh, but, yeah, and I wanted to share it with you because of the amount of Mopar, you know, bands that you have. Like, and it's just a way of showing a lot more people. You know, this is one of the cars I've never owned. Okay. I've never had a, a TA or an AR. Me neither. <laughs> Funnily enough. Funnily enough. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the quick tour of this beautiful, beautiful car. Thanks for sharing it with us. No and like I said, you go over to his channel and he'll have all of the... Yeah, we'll go through the repair and the road tests and... Take um, this thing for a rip. Yeah, I'll have to be... I mean, you have to be a little respectful and not rip it too no, much. No, 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 no. <laughs> dang shift second gear and... Oh, and, no, yeah. no, no. Not on... Not on no, no, not with video evidence. No, I don't think that's a good idea. I've, I've done this before, right? But I've got to show him since since he's here. So the, six, the, uh, the pistol grip shifter. So these things... Oh, I got that. She noise. So these shifters... I did a whole video on this. In 69, one of the guys that worked in the styling department mm. had a four-speed car. Right. I don't know what it was. And he whittled one of these shifters out of a piece of oak. And it was for his personal car. Right. So when he brought it into, you know, to show his friends in the styling department, they were like, okay, we have to make that. And so that's how the pistol grip was born. This really? was just a brainstorm of somebody in the styling department. And it fits the hand absolutely perfectly. Like, you can't not power shift this thing. All right. <laughs> Enough of that, guys. I'll see you tomorrow.